Okay, so we have been talking about DNA and structure DNA replication. This was sort of what we spent the first half of the 1900s on in biology. Again, it was late 1800s we even discovered DNA existed. And then the first question was, what's the hereditary material? Is it DNA or protein? By the 1920s, 1930s, we figured out it was DNA. And the next question was, well, what does DNA look like? And how is it put together? And by the 1950s, Watson and Crick figured out the structure of DNA. And then the next question was, well, how does DNA replicate itself? And by the 1960s, we figured out DNA replication. Well, the next couple of questions came after that were, how do you actually turn the DNA into a protein? How do you actually turn the DNA into a protein? And that we sort of solved in the 70s, late 60s, 70s. How do you take this chemical code of A, G, C, and T and actually make a three-dimensional physical functioning protein? How do you make that chemical message into a real functioning protein? How does it work? Was what we were trying to establish. Because once we figured that out, things really took off. And today, we can do a lot of crazy stuff because we figured that out. Because once we figured out how to turn the code into protein, then we said, ooh, I wonder if I could play around with the code. And if I play around with the code, can I change the protein? And we found out, yes, you can. And this gets into biotechnology, which we'll get into in a couple weeks. And so we started doing some really strange stuff. Now, we've always been interested in biology and mixing things around and playing around with genetics and mixing genes. We've done that for centuries. We've done that with crops. We've done that with animals. And we took the original tomatoes were in South America about the size of a grape. That's the same beef steak tomato you pull off the plant today came from that original grape-sized tomato. Corn originally was about the size of your index finger. Look at corn today. That's all due to breeding. All right. One of the best examples, take a look at what we did with the wolf. Gentlemen. From the wolf, we made all the dogs that exist. Everything from these mastiffs and Great Danes down to these ankle-biting chihuahuas. Okay. All of those things came from wolves. Okay. And that was all due to what we call selective breeding. Right. We do the same with horses and goats and pigs and cats and all that type of stuff. But traditionally, up until recently, we always had to follow sort of one basic rule. You had to breed within the same species. You could only mix dogs with dogs. You could only mix horses with horses. You could only mix corn with corn. Right. Now that we figured out, we figured out how the code gets turned into the protein, we figured out how to play around with the code. And so we've done things, and these are real stories, We've done things like take a gene from the Arctic cod. Cod is a fish that lives in the Arctic waters where it's very, very cold, minus 40 degrees. And they actually produce a protein in their blood that's almost like an antifreeze. And so what we did is we took that protein and we put it into strawberries to try to make strawberries frost resistant. We weren't sure what was going to happen. Would the strawberry taste like a fish? Mm -hmm. Would we create fish berries? Okay. Um, that's one that didn't quite work, okay, but we did try it. Um, we took a gene from um, a jellyfish which glows in the dark, and we put it into the leaves of tomato plants so that when a tomato plant needed watering, it would glow. Okay. That one actually worked to some degree, but wasn't real practical. Okay. But then we have done some really good things, especially in medicine. We've taken genes from humans and put them into bacteria. And now bacteria produce insulin for us. And that's the number one way we treat diabetics today is through the insulin that's produced by genetically engineered bacteria, which is actually works a lot better because prior to that, where did we get our insulin from was pigs and sheep. And putting pig insulin or sheep insulin into a human was OK. It didn't work perfectly, but it was better than nothing. Today, now that we have human insulin, which we now have bacteria produce for us, it works much better. So that's where we're going to go with it eventually. So first we have to figure out how do you go from the code to the protein, and then we're going to look at today how we're able to manipulate that code 
and do all types of crazy stuff. Some that could be potentially very good and some that have some real concerns. Right? How close are we to being able to select all this stuff for our children before they're even born, for example? And should we be selecting all of this stuff before our children are even born? Uh, should we be messing with the genetics of anybody? That is some of the things we will venture into. So let's reestablish a couple things before we talk about how we make a protein. Right? So in the, in the previous unit, we established a couple things. One, we should have learned that genes carry the instructions for making proteins. Genes carry the instructions for making proteins. And why do genes carry instructions? Because genes are made of DNA. Genes are made of DNA, which means they are nucleotide sequences. They contain A, G, C's, and T's. They contain A, G, C's, and T's. So each gene has a sequence of A, G, C's, and T's, which determine the sequence of the amino acids, which determines how they fold, which determines the shape, which determines the functional protein. So in our big strand here hanging across the room, this section might be a gene. Then maybe that determines eye color. Skip a few bases and maybe this section determines your height. Skip a few genes and maybe this section determines whether you have hair on your ears or you don't. Right? So forth and so on. In this one piece of DNA, we might have a dozen genes. So genes are short sections of DNA that code for a single protein. Going anywhere? And I want you to understand, genes are made of nucleotides, which means they have base sequences, A, G, C's, and T's. That's where the codes are. That's where the information is. And then we, so that's why I just said, the information for making a protein lies in the sequence of those nucleotides. What order these letters are in, again, totally determines what the protein is going to be. The order of these letters determines the protein, whether you, here we've got guanine, thymine, cytosine, adenine, guanine, thymine, cytosine, adenine, guanine, thymine, adenine, cytosine, a real repetitive pattern that's going to produce a particular type of protein. Up here we've got a different pattern that's going to produce a different protein. But where the next thing went after the discovery of DNA replication was we had a problem. And the problem was the DNA which is needed to make the protein is found in the nucleus. It's inside the nucleus. And the place where we make the DNA, remember, is in something called a ribosome. This was something we talked about first semester when we talked about cells. Something called a ribosome where we actually make the protein. So, put this together a little bit. We've got to make proteins. Well, the directions for making proteins are found in genes. Specifically, they're found in the nucleotide sequences of the genes. But those are all kept in the DNA, which is in the nucleus. The protein is made over here in the cytoplasm by the ribosome. So one of the next questions we had to figure out was, how do you get the information from the DNA in the nucleus over here to the ribosome? Because the nucleus DNA out. The DNA is double-stranded. Remember, it's double-stranded. It's a large molecule that can't fit through the gaps in the nuclear membrane. It doesn't leave the nucleus. So we had to figure out how do you get the information, the directions from the nucleus out here to the cytoplasm where the ribosome is ready to build the protein. An analogy might be, I'm an architect, and I have the, I have the master blueprints for building a building. You're the construction crew at the job site ready to build the building. I have the directions. You have the building site. You can't build the directions, the blueprints. All right. As an architect, am I going to give you my original copy of the blueprints? No, I'm not giving you the original copy of my blueprints because what could happen? They could get lost. They could get stolen, they could get damaged, you could spill your coffee on it, or your latte, or whatever it is you drink. Um, 
there's lots of things that could happen to it. So I'm not going to give you my original blueprints, but what will I give you? A copy of them. A copy of them. Right? I'm going to give you a copy of my blueprints. So you know what to do at the building site. Well, the same thing is happening. This is not going to give you the original DNA. We don't want the original DNA out of the nucleus because we don't want it getting lost, tangled, damaged. But we will make some copies of the pieces of DNA and send those out to the ribosome. Following it all. Okay. So we had to figure out what is it that goes between the nucleus and the cytoplasm. What's going to carry the information from the DNA to the ribosome? All right. And so these two questions became the next two natural. Oh my. Excuse me a second. No, it's not. All right. So anyway, if you're viewing this at home, we got a small smart board issue here for half a second. Okay, so hopefully we've got this working. So there are two questions that come up. There's two questions that come up that through the 1960s, 1970s, we had to solve. One of those questions was, how does the DNA information get to the ribosome? How does the DNA information get from the nucleus to the ribosome? That was one question we needed to solve. The other question was, how does the ribosome then turn the DNA information, I put info, information, into a protein? So that the, those are the next two big questions in biology after Watson and Crick and Nesselson and Stahl's work. Um, how do you get the information from the DNA to the ribosome? And then once you do get it to the ribosome, how does the ribosome turn that into a protein? So again, that second one, and if you're having a hard time reading it, how does the ribosome turn the DNA info or information into a protein? Those are the two questions we're going to try to answer over the next few days. That's sort of the focus of what we're trying to figure out are those two questions. How do you get the information to the ribosome? This is a process we're going to eventually call transcription. And then how do you turn that into a protein and this is the process we're eventually going to call translation. Well, the breakthrough came, or the answer came, in the form of another nucleic acid called RNA. RNA became an important molecule to our understanding. RNA is the other nucleic acid. It stands for ribonucleic acid instead of DNA, which is deoxyribonucleic acid. And RNA ends up being the molecule necessary for turning DNA into protein. Now, when you compare RNA to DNA, there are a few similarities and there are some big differences. Right? Similarity-wise, similar -wise, they're both polymers. They're both made of monomers. They're both made of nucleotides. All right? And they do use three of the same four bases. They do use three of the same four bases. So they're both made of nucleotides. That's one similarity. And they both use adenine, A, guanine, G, and C, cytosine. Which one am I leaving out? Thymine is being left out because it doesn't use thymine, we'll see in a moment. All right, there's a couple differences there. Right? 
So if you look at the picture, we can start to see some of the differences. Right here is the DNA, double-stranded, double helix. Right. To the right of that picture is the RNA. And we should notice the RNA, how is it different immediately, can you see? It's a single strand. RNA is one strand, or DNA is a double strand. That's important. Why? Because by it being single-stranded, it's smaller. And because it's smaller, it can actually go out of the nucleus. It can actually fit out through the openings in the nuclear membrane and actually go out of the nucleus and travel to the ribosome. So one of the things RNA is going to do, as we'll get to, is it's going to be the go-between. Go back to being the architect. If I'm the architect in my office with my master blueprint, am I going to personally drive that over to the job site? Probably not. I'm going to hire some type of messenger or courier service. They're going to come to my office, pick it up, and deliver it to the job site for me. Same thing's going to happen in the cell. The nucleus is not going to let the DNA deliver that information itself. It's going to use RNA as a go-between to deliver the information to the ribosome. Another thing you'll notice when you look at the picture uh, is on the left here, and I'll come back to these in a minute, on the left you've got your four bases, C, G, A, and T. That's in DNA. But in RNA, you still have a C, you still have a G, you still have an A, but bingo, we replace the T with something called U or uracil. Almost the same, but chemically, uracil doesn't react well with ribose, so you have to change it. Functionally, U and T pretty much do the same thing. Functionally, U and T do the same thing. All right, so let's note a couple of things. RNA is single-stranded, where DNA is still double-stranded. That makes it easy for RNA to get in and out of the nucleus, which DNA cannot do. Another thing that is not as obvious on the picture, but it's true is there's a different sugar. DNA, as we've already mentioned before, contains the sugar deoxyribose. Thus, it starts with a D. RNA contains a different sugar called ribose. So one of the ways you can tell DNA from RNA besides the single double strand is there's a different sugar. And the last one is RNA uses a fourth base that's different. RNA uses something called uracil, U-R-A-C-I-L, uracil, in place of thymine. Again, chemically, there's a difference as to how it will bind. So that's why we have to have a difference. Biologically, U and T pretty much work the same way. So you see later on, if you're dealing with a molecule that's got a U in it, a strand that has a U in it, that's an indicator you're looking at RNA. If you're dealing with a strand that has a T in it, then you're dealing with DNA. It's one of the key ways to tell them between RNA and, T and DNA. RNAs have U's, DNAs have T's. Because they use that one different base. Yes, good point to make up. So in RNA, A binds with U instead of T. C still binds with G. That still works that way. But if you're dealing with RNA, it's A with U instead of A with T. Okay? So what we ended up finding out as we went further into our study of RNA is there's many different types of RNA. And we found there were three different types of RNA that helped turn the genetic code into a protein. There's three different types of RNA that helped turn the genetic code into a protein. Nowadays, we know there's at least a dozen different types of RNAs. And we'll get into some of those other ones later. We're finding out RNA does a lot more than we originally thought. Okay. For a long time, we thought DNA was the king, and RNA was like the little brother, the, the second thought. We're actually starting to maybe think we got it backwards. RNA may actually may be the more important molecule. It does a lot more things than DNA is capable of doing. 
uh, and DNA may be just sort of the tag along. Uh, but we're not ready to, to say that for sure. But there's a lot of things RNA are involved in, and we'll get into some of that a little bit later in the course. Today, we're just going to focus on the three types of RNA that help us make a protein. There's three types of RNA that help us make a protein. The first one is called mRNA. M stands for messenger. Stands for messenger. Let me see if I can successfully switch the page without this all freezing up on us. So the first one is what we call messenger RNA. And it's called that because it is literally a messenger. Messenger RNA is the one that's going to come in here and get the message from the DNA, and it's going to leave the nucleus, and it's going to bring the message to the ribosome. That's why we call it messenger RNA. It's the carrier of the information. Now, what's happening here is we're not copying all 46 chromosomes. We're not dividing. We're making a protein. Your body is capable of making over 100,000 different proteins. So I'm not taking all the information over here to make all 100,000 proteins. That would be a waste of time and energy. What I'm doing is I'm finding out what protein I need to make and taking just the information for making that one protein, which brings up new questions. How do you know what protein you want to make? How long do you want to make that protein? How do you know? How do you find that gene for making that protein? These are all questions we had to figure out, and we had, we had figured out a lot of them. All right. So mRNA comes in, finds the gene you want to make. Maybe we need protein X, whatever protein X is. I'm just making a generic protein. I come in. I find the protein I need. Say it's protein X. I find the gene. Here's the gene for making protein X. And I copy it into RNA. I'm the messenger RNA. I now take that information to the ribosome and I say, Mr. Ribosome, here's how you make protein X. Here's the directions. With me? Yes or no? Yeah. Right. Then it's going to be a little confusing at first. So its job is to carry information from the DNA in the nucleus to the ribosome in the cytoplasm. That's its job. Now, once I get to the ribosome, I got the directions, but what else am I going to need if I'm going to build something? I need equipment. I need materials. And I also need somebody that knows how to read the blueprint. I need somebody that knows how to read the information. So as the architect, if I send the blueprint to the job site, and none of you has ever worked with a blueprint before and have no idea how to read it, we're in trouble. Hopefully, at least the foreman knows how to read the blueprint so they can tell everybody else what to do. Preferably, the whole crew knows how to read a blueprint because they're experienced. But I also need materials. They don't just pop up out of nowhere. Someone's got to drop off the wood. Someone's got to drop off whatever it is you need, the cement, but whatever. All right? So you have two other types of RNA to do that. The second type of RNA is called the ribosomal RNA. RRNA stands for ribosomal RNA. The job of the ribosomal RNA is to be the decoder, to be the reader of the directions. Someone's got to be able to read the directions. That's what the ribosomal RNA does. It's actually part of the ribosome. It's actually part of the ribosome. So it forms the ribosome and it translates the mRNA, the messenger RNA, into an amino acid chain, which is again going to be a protein. So this is like the guy on the job site who's responsible for reading the blueprints. Somebody's got to read the blueprints and tell the crews what to do. 
And that's what the ribosome RNA does. So mRNA provides the blueprints. Our RNA's job is to read the blueprints and coordinate things. All right, so now I got directions. I got someone who can read the directions and coordinate the work, but I still need building materials. Can't build a brick wall without bricks. Can't frame a house without lumber. So you've got to have materials. That's where the third RNA comes in. The third RNA we call tRNA for transfer RNA. It's going to transfer the building materials to the site, to the ribosome. Uh, the analogy is it's often like a delivery truck. tRNA is somewhat like a delivery truck. All right. Its job is to pick up specific amino acids and deliver them to the mRNA. So between the three of them, they can get the job done. The mRNA brings the instructions, the RNA reads the instructions, and then uses the materials provided by the tRNA to build the protein. See if you can follow that. The mRNA brings the directions, the RNA reads the directions, and uses the materials provided by the tRNA to build the protein. Does that make any sense? We're just introducing you to the new components. We really haven't put the story together yet. And I'm going to add a little bit more to this one, which is not going to make a lot of sense yet. I'm telling you up front, it won't make a lot of sense yet. But it will in a day or two. All right? These tRNAs don't come in just randomly. They have what's called an anticodon based on their anticodon. That's anti-codon they match up to what's called the codon. I don't expect that little part of the statement will make any sense at all yet. But I'm putting it in there now because later when you go back and look at your notes to study, it will make perfect sense. So, in other words, what, we're, what this is going to get to is the tRNAs just don't randomly bring in any amino acid any old time they want to. There's a coding system. The codes have to match up so you get specific amino acids in specific orders. And again, it's the order of the amino acids that determines how it folds, which determines the shape, which determines the function. The order of the amino acids is critical. It's not random. So this anti-codon and codon system are the way that we specify which amino acid goes where. That's what we'll get into. And it's a way to determine where to put the amino acids so it's not just random. Questions yet? So you're getting itchy. It's too early yet. So in this picture, just try to point out a few things. Here's my original piece of DNA in the nucleus. Out here is my ribosome. So here's the directions up here in the DNA. Down here is the ribosome where I'm going to make it. So step one, the DNA has to open up where the gene is, just the one gene, and we're going to make RNA. So first step is to make the mRNA. The mRNA then leaves the nucleus. You can see it's going out of the nucleus, out of the cytoplasm where it attaches in step two. That's step one. Step two, it attaches to the ribosome. And then in step three, these represent the tRNAs. And the tRNAs bring in the amino acids to build this protein chain. Again, this picture will make more sense as we get through the process. But the DNA opens up. We make a piece of mRNA. The mRNA goes to the ribosome and the cytoplasm. The tRNAs bring in the amino acids based on a, a, codons matching up, and we build a specific protein. Here's what's going to happen. This first step up here 
that's going to be something called transcription, which you can see is the next heading. And this down here will be the second step, which is called translation. And that's how we're going to proceed. Anything? Okay. So we're going to hold right now, this is still molecular genetics, it's MG7. Okay. And we will pick up tomorrow. Yes.